Selena. <sighs> Selena Kyle. You're fired. And Bruce Wayne. Why are you dressed up like Batman? Because he is Batman, you moron. Batman Returns is not a perfect film. Batman Returns is messy. Batman Returns is convoluted. Batman Returns is at times an uncomfortable and dare I say chaotic experience. Just the pussy I've been looking for. The fuck you mean? A confusing, messy, insanely dark movie with some truly awful fantasies from Tim Burton. But you know what else it is? Batman Returns is the perfect Christmas experience. An almost perfect tale of redemption for Batman. Something we don't often see in media. But most importantly, Batman Returns makes Batman 89 better. Yeah, you heard me right. Without this movie, I would not like Batman 89 at all. And I already don't like it that much. Suck my dick. Yes, I am one of the two contrarians on the planet that actually thinks Batman Returns is much better than Batman 89. Yes, it is Tim Burton at his most insane and unrestrained, and the film both benefits and suffers from that. Is the film contrived? Without a doubt. There are so many things in the film that you could say don't make sense, and you'd be right. It's the perfect Christmas movie, a film you can turn your brain off and have a lot of fun enjoying. And I could go on and on about how much fun I have watching it, about how much I love it, but instead, I like to focus on something in the film that's actually really good and overlooked. See, I don't have that much to say about the overall movie. It's fine. It's not technically great. It's very flawed and plot hole heavy, but it's also so much fun to watch, so I don't really care. There's a certain character arc, though, a certain character that doesn't get a lot of love in this movie, or he does, but not for the right reasons, I don't think. There's a certain character arc that I think saves this version of Batman that we need to talk more about, and that's Batman himself. If you watched my Batman 89 video, you know that while I love Michael Keaton the role, I had a lot of issues with this version of Batman. In Batman 89, I thought he was very severely underwritten. He wasn't very compelling, he was just kind of carried by Michael Keaton's charm and amazing performance. Outside of that, his character is a complete mystery, and barely even the main character. We know almost nothing about him, he's just kind of crazy and fun and likable because he's Michael Keaton. He was a very shallow protagonist, and I could never really get behind him in the first film. And watching this film without the context of Batman 89 in mind, I would probably say the same thing. But lucky for us, I do have the context of that film in mind. And working both these films together, I think it makes for a pretty damn good arc. And one that's very unique to this interpretation of Batman. And overall saves this movie for me. And it's an arc that we don't normally associate with Batman. And that's a redemption arc. Yes, other interpretations in live action have dabbled in it, but none went quite like this one. For Batman, he doesn't normally have redemption arcs quite like this, but here it's very unique and I would say it works just well enough for me to like it. Mostly. Now before I get into this arc, I think we need to establish some rules on adaptations of Batman and specifically whether or not I think Batman should kill because I've never made it that clear, which is my fault. So let's clear that up right now. When it comes to whether or not Batman should be a killer, it's fairly controversial. Now, to be honest, both sides make some pretty fucking shitty arguments, but overall, I lean more towards Batman should not kill. However, I do think stories where Batman is forced to kill or must kill can be very interesting in exploring the psychological toll it takes on him, or just in general seeing what leads to him killing and how he reacts to it. The idea of Batman being forced to break his rule can be compelling if done right. However, the problem movies seem to have is they can never do it right. The problem with Batman v Superman is it attempts to give Batman a redemption arc, but after he is redeemed and realized what he's done wrong, 
he's still fucking killing people. Batman's last act in that movie is to still kill people, and in a film that's never even established, if Batman had a code of not killing, it makes his redemption very confusing, and it doesn't make it clear whether or not the film is rooting for Batman to kill or not rooting for Batman to kill. However, there are also stories that depict Batman killing well, such as the incredibly underrated Gotham show. In that show, Bruce was tempted and then made a choice to kill Ra's al Ghul in season 4, and the rest of the season is about his depression dealing with that. It depicted the psychological toll that killing Raish had on Bruce extremely well, and honestly better than all live-action interpretations have. Stories like that with Batman killing I think work very well, but stories where he's just murderously on a rampage, I'm sorry, but they're so fucking boring. I think the reason why Batman's so beloved by everyone along with Spider-Man and Superman is because those heroes have such a clear distinction on not killing and drawing the line. They will never take a life. If Batman can kill, then all the most interesting stories and popular ones with him can't exist. Long Halloween doesn't exist. Red Hood stories don't exist. Every fascinating story with Joker does not exist. The whole reason that their relationship works and is interesting in most adaptations is that Joker's fascinated by the fact that he can literally do whatever he wants and Batman still won't kill him. That's such an interesting rivalry, and by having Batman kill and rooting for him to kill constantly, it makes that rivalry pointless and non-existent. So yeah, I think all adaptations of Batman should have some kind of rule on not killing. How it's formed, though, is different, and that's what brings me to Burton's version of Batman. It's safe to say that in these movies, Batman doesn't exactly have the biggest problem with killing people. And for a long time, I've kind of been annoyed at that, or at least I used to be. Looking beneath it though, I think I found a really interesting story in regards to Batman killing. A story of redemption. A story where Batman truly goes too dark and has to bring himself back. Through the help of Selina Kyle. Sort of. Now, I'm gonna be honest, I'll be kinda reaching for this one, but just hear me out for a bit. In Batman 89, there was a theme that not a lot of people talk about of Alfred being afraid of what Bruce is becoming. It's part of the reason why he was trying so hard to hook him up with Vicki Vale. What's on your mind, Alfred? I have no wish to fill my few remaining years grieving for the loss of old friends. Or their son. There are several scenes in the first film where you can see Alfred is kind of uncomfortable with what Bruce does, even though he understands why he does it. He tries to get Bruce to quit and have a life with Vicki Vale. If not now... When? I don't know. But Bruce can't get past his trauma. He can't move on. He's forever attached to Batman, which breaks Alfred's heart. And after Bruce Wayne realizes Joker killed his parents, it gets worse because after that, he takes his first life. At least, that we know of. Maybe this was by accident, or maybe it wasn't, but whatever the case may be, in Batman 89, the first life Batman takes is in, Ace, is in Access Chemicals after he realizes Joker killed his parents, and one can say he sort of snapped. Yes, this is sort of up for interpretation, but it has more merit than you might think. Up to that point in the film, Batman never killed anyone. In fact, he even tried to save Jack Napier when he fell in Axis Chemicals, but he failed and he fell anyway. But still, Bruce did try to save him. He also didn't kill any of the Joker goons he came that he met before that, and the first two goons he met in the film, he spared. In fact, he wanted them to spread rumors about him and tell all their friends about him. Yes, there are rumors that Johnny Gobbs was killed by Batman. A lot of people like to think that he was. But for all we know, he could have just been someone that Batman scared and tried to save but ended up falling or something like that. It could have been an Ice Princess type situation or something else could have happened. Who knows? We never see it, so we can't really say for sure. I choose to interpret it as Johnny Gobbs died in an encounter with Batman indirectly, perhaps because of him, but Batman didn't directly kill him. He probably tried to save him or something. And up until this point in the film, Batman was not a killer.
That's the best way to interpret it in my opinion, and you'll see why in a moment. The third act is when Batman actually kills several people, and they're all Joker and his goons. And now Batman has kind of gone to the dark side, one could say. Maybe Batman got a taste for it. Maybe he thought, hmm, killing criminals isn't so bad. And clearly he must have, because in this movie, he kills way more than he did in Batman 89. From the very beginning of Batman Returns, Batman is very visibly different. He's much more aggressive, much more cruel, and much more quick to take a life. At the beginning of 89, he actively avoided it and even tried to save the criminals, but now he doesn't give one flying fuck. He has a complete disregard for criminal life. Every now and then, he'll accidentally knock him out, but for the most part, he's completely fine with killing him. The madman even fucking smiles when he's doing it. This is where Selina Kyle comes in. Now, everyone loves Selina in this movie, and rightfully so, Michelle Pfeiffer plays her extremely well, but no one ever talks about the role she plays in Bruce's story in this film. When you watch Batman Forever and you come across the best scene in the movie... So, you're willing to take a life? As long as it's Two-Face. Then, it will happen this way. You make the kill. But your pain doesn't die with Harvey, it grows. So you run out into the night to find another face. And another. And another. Until one terrible morning you wake up and realize that revenge has become your whole life. And you won't know why. That realization hits Bruce because of the journey he goes on in this film with Selena. As he says later on... We're the same. Split. Right down the center. Selena and Bruce are both incredibly fucked up. Two incredibly fucked up individuals who this entire time have been motivated by revenge and pain. Bruce by the loss of his parents and Selena by the loss of her own fucking life in several ways. They both go after the men that wronged them and have the intent to kill him. Batman has already killed the man who wronged him. Selina is very early in her career. She just became Catwoman and doesn't really take a life until the end of the film. Like Batman just a movie ago, she only wants to kill the person responsible for fucking her own life over. Bruce can understand that. He's been through it because him and Selina are indeed two sides of the same coin. For Selina, it's Max Shrek. For Bruce, it was Joker. And in many ways, at the end of Batman 89, Joker won because he made Batman snap. And ironically, for something he didn't even know he did. Now Bruce is still dealing with the consequences of that. The revenge he got didn't satisfy him, just like it won't satisfy Selina. Just like it won't eventually satisfy Dick Grayson. All of this hits Bruce when he sees Selina at the ballroom. Or don't give me a killing Max won't solve anything speech because it will. Aren't you tired of this sanctimonious Robert Baron always coming out on top when he should be six feet under? I'm sure you have a lot of problems with your boss, but I mean, who the hell do you think you are? I don't know anymore, Bruce. <laughs> Catwoman very much represents the dark mirror to Bruce in this film, someone who's almost exactly like he was in the previous film. If you choose to interpret it this way, it could explain why Batman doesn't just kill Catwoman or doesn't just take her in. At times, he'll leave her be because he's confused and because he sees a part of himself in her. I'm still not 110% sold on Bruce letting her go as many times as he does, but it's the best explanation I can come up with, so just fucking run with it, who cares? All of this changes Bruce's mindset in the third act. Instead of straight up killing Penguin, he just kind of knocks him around, and granted, Penguin still dies, but Batman's not the one that kills him there, it's his umbrella thing that had bats in it. And to get back on my critical side here, I do wish Batman made more of an effort to save him, you know, maybe like Jack Napier, you could add a callback to that. It'd have made the scene a lot stronger, and it would have emphasized my point a lot better, but whatever, I guess. As I said before, the arc is not perfect, and there's a lot more that I would have changed with it. You know, I think it could have dived into it a bit more. And had the film given Keaton more screen time, it maybe would have. At least I like to hope so. The problem is, I think Burton wanted a lot of this movie and his previous film to be left up to interpretation. To the point where the arc is straight up whether or not you interpret it as what it is. 
the point of view I'm providing is just a possible explanation or a possible arc that I'm assuming he went through. It's a way to watch these movies that I think makes it better and improves them. But there's other ways you can interpret it because it the film doesn't make it insanely clear and it doesn't focus a ton on Batman's arc or at least or at least not as much as it should. On the one hand, completely leaving it up to interpretation does make the films a bit more interesting and it keeps us coming back to them. But at the same time, I would have liked to have a lot more emphasis on this arc because I think it dramatically improves the films. Still, with everything we have, I would say this arc just barely works. It's kind of weird. It's on the very edge of not working at the same time on the very edge of working. Anyway, then we get the best scene in the movie. Batman trying to save Selina, trying to stop her from becoming him. Let's just take him to the police. Then we can go home. Together. My personal favorite Batman scenes are ones of him trying to redeem people and trying to save them. And I wish we would get more pieces of modern media that did this. Yes, everyone loves to watch Batman fight crime and solve mysteries, but I don't think we get enough of these type of scenes anymore, and I miss them. I would, I would love to live with you in your castle. Forever just like in a fairy tale. I just couldn't live with myself, so don't pretend this is a happy ending. Unfortunately, like Batman in the last movie, Selina chooses the darker path. Maybe one day she'll redeem herself like Batman has. All that matters is now, Batman is back. The true Batman's here, and he is done killing people. With all this context in mind, I think it makes his arc and his character in Batman Forever a lot stronger with everything he says to Dick about not killing people. Had Burton been able to make his Batman Forever, having Keaton deliver all these lines I think would have made it even better, and I'll always be a little bummed that we never got it even though I do actually kind of like Batman Forever, but still. And that was the redemption of Tim Burton's Batman. So, is the arc perfect? No. Like I said, a lot of it is really just up to interpretation. I think what's kind of cool, but also kind of a flaw in these two movies, like I said earlier, is you can interpret them in several different ways, and depending on your interpretation, the films either benefit or don't benefit from it. Am I at all trying to argue that Burton did any of this on purpose? Honestly, no. I would be shocked if he did any of this on purpose. Personally, I don't think Burton gives one flying fuck about Batman, but putting that aside, I do like this perspective, and I think it makes the films a lot better. Now, what I'm offering here is not an objective point of view. It's not what I think Tim Burton really intended necessarily. I think a lot of things about his Batman he purposely left up to our interpretation. This point of view I think makes for a pretty interesting story and had it been given more emphasis in the films it would have been even better. Like I said though, there's multiple perspectives you can view these films in and some of them are I think are good and some of them I think aren't. I will say, when you watch the films the perspective I've provided, I think they make for a much more interesting experience and I think they also improve the films dramatically because without this perspective, Batman's just kind of crazy. Without this perspective, Batman just kind of kills sometimes, and at times doesn't. He only really does it when it's convenient for him. But of course, that's all just my perspective. I'm curious what your guys' perspectives are. I know Batman Returns is fairly controversial, but personally, I think with this perspective in mind, it makes the film a lot better and more enjoyable. Oh, and uh, Merry Christmas. You know, instead of watching Christmas Vacation or Elf or some other boring Christmas movie, why don't you watch Batman Returns? with all this context in mind. See how it holds up. Or don't, I don't really care. <laughs>